Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is uh, Frederick Winsness with uh, NetHope and the NetHope Solution Center. I want to welcome you all to yet another uh, uh, webinar with the ICT4D um, group and uh, uh, the, the webinar series uh, related to the ICT4D conference. Um, today, we're going to be talking about digital financial tools for humanitarian response. And as you see, we have a host of speakers today, um, obviously from Catholic Relief Services, who hosts the ICT4D conference uh, with Mercy Corps, with Humanity Chain, uh, Be, uh, Be Data Ready, UNICEF, UNHCR, and WFP. And um, before we get started, um, I just want to go over uh, our normal housekeeping uh, rules. So uh, let's make this interactive. I uh, suggest everybody opens up the chat window. You can do that by using the um, icon, the third icon from the right, uh, right below the slides. And um, keep an eye on the chatter there. Uh, post your questions, and we will do a facilitated Q&A session towards the end of the hour today. Uh, we are recording this session today, and uh, you'll get a follow-up email with links to the recording and uh, presentations that will be posted on the Solution Center uh, in a few hours. And also at the very end, uh, when you close out the webinar today, you'll see a, a webinar satisfaction poll, and we certainly would appreciate you answering those few questions uh, to help, help us improve this series uh, over time. So uh, with that, um, I want to introduce uh, Alesh, Alesh Brown. He is uh, a consultant on the digital ID. Uh, he uh, is a specialist within uh, payments and blockchain and the founder of uh, Be Data Ready and uh, Humanity Chain. So over to you, Alice. Thank you, William. And uh, thanks, everybody, for taking the time to listen to what should be an interesting presentation. Um, so over the next 30 minutes, we're going to be taking you through three presentations looking at various aspects relating to digital financial tools for humanitarian response and how they're rapidly transforming the way we deliver assistance. As mentioned earlier, feel free to make an interactive and post comments. You can do that publicly or privately through the chat box at the bottom right. Um, and at the end, we'll collate those and have a bit of a Q&A. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our line of speakers. First of all, we'll have Max Nicholas, who's a consultant working for Mercy Calls around user-centered design and mobile payments. We'll then be followed up by William Martin, who's a technical advisor at CRS, looking at digital payments and data protection. And then finally, we'll have a presentation by three different stakeholders on the Louise Unified Payment Platform in Lebanon. And we'll have Charbel Habib from WSP, who's a cash and voucher specialist. We'll have Marina Akasalova, apologies, I probably mispronounced your surname, who's the assistant representative of UNHCR in Lebanon, Beirut. And Maxime Bayzen, or Bayzen, who's the country office cash transfer specialist at UNICEF. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton over to Max Nicholas to give us his presentation on user-centered design and digital payments with Mercy Corps. Thanks. Thank you for the kind intro. Um, Max Nichols, just to, <laughs> just to um, correct that. Um, but thanks everybody for tuning in this close to um, Christmas. I'm sure a fair number of you are going on holidays. So thank you all for tuning in and, and spending some time with us talk about digital financial services. Um, I have been working on mobile wallet projects in Jordan um, for the last uh, six to eight months. Uh, we've been doing a number of different ones. In this uh, presentation, I just want to kind of take you through some of the, uh, the realities that we're seeing on the ground um, regarding mobile wallets. Um, and then I, it's going to be more of an overview, and then we'll get into kind of the specifics um, of some of these findings as well, you know, as whatever int most interests all of you. Um, in the Q&A session at the end. So I'll try to be brief so we can have some time for, for that. Um, and I want, hopefully these results are um, relevant to all of you. I know these are going to be country specific to Jordan. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are working in Jordan, but a lot of the findings that we have um, should be relevant to any kind of uh, discussion of digital financial services um, really anywhere. 
Um, so first and foremost, why mobile wallets? Why are we looking at this technology? Um, there's a number of reasons in Jordan specifically why we're looking at it. Um, first and foremost, approximately 60% of Jordan is unbanked. So um, for a number of reasons, 60% uh, of residents in Jordan um, do not have access to any kind of formal financial um, system. Um, there's, and that 60% that tends to skew more towards vulnerable populations. Um, that's younger people, um, that's older people, and then that's displaced folks um, and poor folks. Um, there's a massive population eligible for humanitarian cash transfers, and as many of you may know, the logistics of humanitarian cash transfers um, are very complicated. As we're going to hear uh, from the other panelists, a number of different um, testimonials to, to, to the complexity. Um, so with that, um, it's important to kind of explore all options to, to see which ones are kind of most appropriate based on the context. Um, and then the kind of final major reason is that the, the, the National Financial Inclusion Strategy of Jordan, Jordan is one of these countries that has taken that kind of World Bank financial inclusion strategy um, and has applied it and, and written their um, kind of a strategy for the next couple of years. Um, in it, it's, it specifically calls out digital financial services um, as a pillar of, of inclusion efforts here in Jordan. Um, so those three reasons kind of make it a very attractive um, uh, context to be looking at uh, mobile wallets. And mobile wallets, I'll back up, and for um, some of you who may not know, mobile wallets are just uh, tend to be mobile-based um, transaction accounts at their most basic um, in which you can receive and send payments um, and do other basic transactions such as airtime top-up and, um, and other integrations with various merchants and such. Um, one of the assumptions that I just is important to call out as we talk about financial inclusion, as we talk about transaction accounts, et cetera, um, is this assumption that access to a transaction account um, is, you know, is one element of financial inclusion um, leads to financial resilience and poverty alleviation. I think that's an assumption that um, while there is a, a large number of cases in which those, that, those two things seem to correlate, um, that's not necessarily a definitive, um, you know, settled um, question. So um, it's just something to, to, I think, keep in mind as we have this conversation. All right, let's go next. So these are the two projects that we've been working on and, and that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, one is more of an operational project, and more is, one is more focused on research. Um, the first one was a pilot that we did. So we had a, a much larger um, cash um, assistance program going on in the north of Jordan um, with Syrian refugees. Um, and then we, we developed this, this pilot uh, because we wanted to see how uh, mobile wallets worked as a cash assistance modality. Um, so we talked with a, a number of our beneficiaries and ended up working with 120 um, female Syrian uh, refugees in both Irbid and Mafraq, which is in northern Jordan. Um, and they were going to be receiving monthly unconditional tra cash transfers in, in the realm of between 100 to 200 um, JD, which is about 150 to 300 US dollars. Um, and the purpose was to determine kind of the effectiveness and the, the, the experience um, that these women had working with mobile wallets as the, the manner of, of receiving cash as opposed to a more traditional ATM-based approach. Um, the second project we did as kind of a follow-on was to get a deeper understanding of kind of how mobile wallets could fit within the Jordanian context. Um, so with this is actually, we did not work exclusively with, with uh, humanitarian organization beneficiaries or, or even partners. We just um, worked with uh, a number of up to approximately 50 entrepreneurs, business operators, and then various stakeholders in the kind of mobile wallet ecosystem here in Jordan. Um, we did that in five different governorates of 12, so a pretty wide um, geographic range from the, the, the center capital, Amman, all the way out to very rural areas. Um, and the purpose of this was to understand both kind of digital financial services usage as they stand now in Jordan, so what is taking off and what isn't, but also to understand more general financial behavior of these business owners and operators um, to see how digital financial services, what's, what are the most, uh, the, the, the highest probability cases in which, you know, or businesses, sectors, et cetera, um, where digital financial services could really make an impact, particularly in these vulnerable communities. Um, so that was the, it was, it was, that was the, the, the lead on to the more operational um, project that we did with the, the refugees. So we'll go, um, We'll go next slide. Thank you. 
Um, what's working? So in Jordan, um, there are five different mobile wallet providers, uh, both mobile network operators, meaning telecom companies, and standalone mobile wallets. That's good because it gives uh, customer choice. Um, it makes it so that people can choose based on their needs and based on the um, various elements of those providers, such as agent network coverage, etc. cetera. Um, Lots of pilots are happening right now with mobile wallets, which is very good. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration and information sharing on how this modality impacts beneficiaries, how this modality impacts partners, um, what are the limits. Um, so lots of learning going on, which is great. Um, there are potential protection benefits for some of these users. So for female um, beneficiaries, we've seen that perceptions of uh, risk uh, can be lower, uh, primarily because funds can be received in a more discreet manner than going out to a hawala or a ATM. And then transactions can also occur within the home. So airtime pop-up, person-to-person payments such as landlords or relatives, et cetera, can all happen from within the home without having to go to these um, different areas that may or may not um, be more risky for certain segments of the population. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Certain segments are really interested in bringing mobile wallets more holistically into their life. Students, entrepreneurs, traders, um, there's a term that's been kind of thrown around a little bit, strivers, these entrepreneurs that are small but are, have, have interest in growing. Um, they have also expressed pretty significant interest in adopting some of these technologies, um, mostly because they have very little access to existing financial services, such as banks. Um, a reason for that is um, in Jordan, a, minimum deposit requirements on banks are very high. B, um, uh, the documentation required to open a bank is actually most um, refugees and uh, from all the different contexts um, that are in Jordan uh, don't actually have the documentation required to open a bank account. So um, these mobile wallets are an opportunity to access those kind of financial services, hence why people are pretty interested in them. Um, and another particularly attractive thing for the humanitarian sector is, it, is the opportunity to, to link cash assistance transfers with more holistic financial inclusion. Um, so this is particularly of interest for those who want to do longer term interventions, um, interested in maybe a graduation model that incorporates cash payments and then into business development or um, other kind of linked interventions such as that. We'll go to the next slide. And then some things that aren't working so well. Um, and a lot of these things will be explained in kind of afterward, after this slide, um, I want to talk about why we kind of went with a user-centered approach and um, to, to trying to solve some of these things. But registration processes and application usage is still really difficult. So there's a lot of confusion about how to go about signing up for one of these wallets, how to use these wallets. Even when humanitarian organizations are there to sign people up, there's still a fair amount of confusion. Um, there hasn't really been a clear use case articulation strategy. So for, for people who are presented with a mobile wallet, there's no really clear empathetic understanding of what problem is this mobile wallet going to solve for me um, based on, and, and particularly not with vulnerable populations. So there's been um, really no clear definition of that. Um, there's also a lack of a widespread usage. So the predominant usage of mobile wallets in Jordan right now um, tend to be kind of unidirectional from the humanitarian sector to beneficiaries. Um, and so that's been, a, been an issue. Um, and then there's been some other sectoral issues in terms of some people not being very, very comfortable with this modality, um, and then other just kind of missing elements of the system. So we'll go to the next slide, and I'll wrap up. Um, so why we wanted to take a user-centered user approach to this and why the next iteration of this system and of these technologies is so important to, a, to bring a user-centered approach, we believe, um, is that the kind of the, the, the stakeholder that's been lost in this conversation is the actual end user. So um, the governments have been accounted for in, to a large extent. Um, the mobile wallet providers have been accounted for in their needs, the central bank, et cetera. But actually bringing these vulnerable um, users who are, you know, interested in using these products, their needs have not necessarily been articulated very clearly in kind of roadmap discussions. Um, the understanding of existing financial behavior that these technologies should then support um, has not really been clearly articulated. Uh, what people are already doing, how businesses are already run, um, has not necessarily been brought to the table when discussing mobile wallets. 
so I'll leave it there and any questions that people have can bring to me in the in the QA um, and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues thank you perfect thank you Max and apologies for mispronouncing your surname no problem uh, Super interesting to hear about the work you're doing and, and how you're trying to approach the, the kind of design process and putting beneficiaries first within, within the ecosystem. I think that's going to be critical, especially as we start to try and transition these mobile payments into kind of broader mainstream adoption. Um, moving forward, I'd like to now pass the baton over to William, who's going to give you a presentation looking at digital payments and data protection. Um, so without further ado, here you go, William. Thank you, Alesh. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is William Martin, and I'm the technical advisor uh, cash and market in market for the Humanitarian Response Department at Catholic Relief Services, CRS. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to present today a CRS case study, and it's complementary uh, of um, the presentation from Mercy Corps, uh, where it will look uh, with us at the data protection side of things and how digitalization uh, of cash transfer program accelerated our efforts toward data protection and beneficiary privacy. So if we look at, uh, at the background and the context first, um, so in the aftermath of a disaster, CRS does more than just give food and water and shelter to people affected. We also provide cash to people uh, to give them more freedom uh, to make choice about whether family need to survive and recover with dignity. And that's uh, what a lot of organizations are also doing too uh, now. And uh, CRS Pioneer, uh, it's not new, CRS Pioneer cash-based programming in 2001 uh, with Innovative Voucher Agriculture Fair in Uganda. And uh, what's new though is uh, the use of technology and the digitalization of this cash transfer. Uh, in terms of volume as well, it increased significantly. So for fiscal year 2017, for example, CRS and its local partner transfer more than $72 million uh, uh, in cash or voucher to beneficiaries in 44 countries. It's probably underreported, um, and not all of it is uh, digital, uh, but that gives you uh, an idea about the, the trend. And that corresponds to what is happening at the global level as well. According to a DI, um, there is uh, so there is a total uh, of 2.8 billion dollar uh, worth of humanitarian assistance that was just burst in cash. That represents approximately 10% of the total humanitarian assistance um, that is distributed, which is about 25 billion dollar. So very early on, CRS has been trying to use uh, ICT 4D for cash intervention whether it is for data collection, uh, beneficiary management, or cash transfers. And the main limiting factors uh, were the technological and financial infrastructure. But now with the maturity of some technology, it's not necessarily a limiting factor anymore. And virtually, there is no infrastructural limiting factor for the use of uh, the ICT 4G of technology, particularly for digital finance. Um, next slide, please. And um, so what are the causes uh, for accelerating um, our effort to our data protection and beneficiary privacy uh, when we did uh, digit more digital cash transfer? So let's take a look at uh, the data we are collecting. So CRS has currently 300 projects live on which we are collecting data electronic, electronically. Sorry. That represents uh, more than 50 million beneficiaries. Not all these projects are cash. On the cash side, uh, we roll out a pilot called the Cash and Asset Transfer Platform, CAT platform, which run on a Red Rose software. It is a data collection and aggregation, uh, beneficiary management, and cash and asset transfer platform. After two years uh, using this platform, we scale up to 13 countries and transfer about like $40 million worth of cash and voucher or asset to over uh, to 130,000 households. So what that means? That means more data are collected electronically. And when we are doing cash, it's, it's shared with more stakeholders. Uh, that includes financial service providers, fintech. So um, that requires to collect them and share them more responsibly to respect data protection and beneficiary privacy principle. 
uh, because what drives us as a humanitarian is a respect of humanitarian principle, particularly the do no harm principle in humanitarian intervention. And now it's reinforced also by some regulations such as uh, GDPR. So because of the digitalization of cash, uh, we are also collecting more personal identifiable information to comply with uh, what we call AML uh, CFT rule, anti-money laundering and counter-financing of terrorism rule. And why we are doing that is uh, because we are considered as non-profit, uh, we are seen by regulators are high-risk profile, particularly after uh, September 11 and the Patriot Act. So we need to know uh, the people who are distributing cash to. Uh, if we don't, uh, banks are doing what we call de-risking the balance sheet. Uh, that means they don't want to provide a service to us and therefore we cannot distribute cash. And that has serious consequence of the delivery of humanitarian assistance. So we need to know our beneficiaries or know our customer in banking lingo, KYC, uh, and make our due diligence to comply with this regulation. But the more we collect data, the more risk we have. Uh, risk of government surveillance, business intelligence, and individuals who want to arm uh, the organization or beneficiaries for different motives, whether it is national uh, money, political, etc. Uh, so, you know, we, it's, it's a serious risk. We consider that a major data breach uh, was a risk as early as 2014. It ranked in our top 40 risk and two years later in 2016 it ranked uh, in our top 12 risk and we stimulated that the odds of a major data breach happening at uh, the agency level not only for cash was only once every was uh, only once every nine years and it happened a uh, newsworthy data breach became a reality for us last year uh, not a major one but uh, uh, we, we had to consider it seriously and uh, it was done for business intelligence purpose. Um, and fortunately, it did not harm our beneficiaries nor the staff. But clearly, it was a tipping point moment for us to intensify our effort on data protection and beneficiary privacy. And this issue was an isolated case, and the hacker provided the insurance that all the data access was destroyed, leaving no risk to beneficiary distribution and vendor payments. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the efforts we made um, at the agency level and prior uh, the data breach? Uh, we did some recruitment or at the same time, we did like uh, recruitment of data protection manager in addition of our data privacy director. We rolled out a data protection steering committee in HQ, uh, including a subcommittee on digital on emergency uh, uh, data collection. Uh, we harmonize across the agency the use of responsible data guiding principle, and we have an agency-wide online capacity building on data protection. And you know, it was like effort ongoing for as early as 2014. But with this, uh, with the risk increasing, uh, we really intensify our effort, and especially with cash transfer program because of the sensitivity of data we are collecting and, and with who we are sharing it. Uh, following up uh, the, our incident, um, specifically for the cash and asset transfer platform and cash transfer program, we took uh, critical action, including um, like to, to make sure our system was, was robust uh, and to make sure our data security and uh, including our security system uh, was, were performing well. Uh, so we worked with our uh, partner, Red Rose, to develop a three-tiered approach to reduce data security risk and protect sensitive and personally, personally identifying data. So for that, we reviewed the organization and management of our platform, uh, which included the delegation of some critical function to our ICT40 team. We worked on the security by default uh, by building back-end back security features into software uh, like our CAD platform, including access limitation, approval requirements for financial transactions, password complexity and change requirements, encrypted data storage and transfers, and audit change logs. We worked also at the policy, procedures, and best practice guidance level, and training on standards operating procedures for data protection compliance. And we also changed our cash transfer policy to adapt to the digitalization of it. Uh, finally, uh, we did some intervention-specific privacy impact assessment, which include an understanding of the local legal jurisdiction, 
um, the assessment of the threats to the program data in that context, and the establishment of an action plan to mitigate risk uh, with the support available from CRS Director of Information Security and Technical Advisors. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, you know what uh, more what can we do in the future? There are a couple, there are obviously more we can do. Uh, and the next steps uh, we are identifying is obviously we still need to insist on high data protection hygiene. I think we meet minimum requirement now, but we need to have high standards for it. Uh, working more on the minimization, the anonymization, the compartmentalization of information uh, that will allow us to reduce the bank de risking I was mentioning, uh, but also not compromising the UMITAN principle and guarantee uh, our access to beneficiaries. We need to work more on clean and standardized data uh, for better aggregation and analysis that will allow us to do more digital cash and more innovative ones, such as trigger-based intervention or predictive modeling or customization of assistance to individual needs. We need to work more on the consent, uh, access, and control of information shared by beneficiaries, making sure they have control for it. It's critical, particularly if we want to build digital identity that would allow uh, financial inclusion. Uh, we need to enhance the security and accountability, and we couldn't do that with technology now uh, working on automated Know Your Customer systems to a communication with beneficiaries. Uh, that brings also a question on data sharing and ethics, you know, uh, sharing with financial service provider and some questions need to be solved on that. And finally, building multi multidisciplinary team or system to allow these different skills um, to intervene in digitalization of cash without necessarily being a cash expert uh, because it became more and more complex and we cannot be experts of everything. So it's how can we build these teams with these different skills without being expert of everything. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, yes, I'm ready to answer a question after all the presentation. Thank you, William. Super interesting presentation. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you very much. I think data is increasingly becoming the new oil and managing it on behalf of vulnerable populations is gonna become an increasingly um, significant issue. Um, I think that segues quite nicely onto our third and our final presentation by Charbel, Marina, and Maxime, looking at the Louise payment platform in Lebanon. Uh, so I'll pass the baton on to you guys. Cheers. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Maxime. So I'm going to start to make the very presentation of uh, the Lebanon One Unified Interorganizational System for e-cards, more simply Louise. Um, so uh, Louise is an integrated uh, and interoperable uh, cash delivery and a joint platform for delivery of cash that was set by uh, UNICEF, WFP, uh, UNHCR, and at the time a, a consortium of uh, NGOs. Um, uh, the objective of uh, Louise is to leverage uh, economy of scale, foster effectiveness, uh, effectiveness and efficiency, uh, as well as finding synergies by putting resources and technical capacities towards a beneficiary-centered one-card uh, cash delivery, right? So uh, how do we do that? Uh, so here you see a little scheme uh, that defines, uh, that describes uh, a lot rapidly uh, the structure of uh, Louise. Uh, I have to remind that first, Louise uh, in 2017 represented um, $393 million uh, that were streamed by the three uh, UN agencies and that uh, reached uh, 1 million uh, uh, beneficiaries, right? Um, we have more or less uh, seven to eight programs uh, that are uh, into this uh, one card, Louise. So how do we do that? Basically, we have uh, a main structure which we, we have um, a governing body, which is uh, you know, composed of the representative that will meet uh, every three months to take uh, uh, big decisions. Then we have, a, a, after, a steering, com a steering committee, which is uh, composed of deputy uh, representatives, which are middle, middle management and high management, which take uh, decisions on a, on a monthly basis. And then after you have, very interesting, the operational and technical work streams. So we're going to go through some of them. To, uh, to show you how we, we, uh, we built that uh, Louis joint, um, let's say, platform. So 
we, d we decided to build these blocks, uh, these uh, technical, uh, let's say, synergies and technical, uh, let's say, joint um, uh, operations uh, through, uh, let's say, the most urgent and the most important. So the first block that we defined was in the financial transaction. Uh, the three agencies went through um, a, a joint financial um, um, yeah, service provider uh, tender uh, to select uh, a one bank, which was done um, together in a joint manner. Once the bank was selected, um, the, the three agencies defined with the three technical members of the, of the agencies to define integrated business processes to, uh, to, a, to be able to issue cards and payments in a joint manner, in a, let's say, or orchestrated manner. That was like, the second biggest uh, work that was done by uh, the three agencies. Uh, third uh, was defined the distribution uh, of uh, these uh, e-cards. We have to, remember, uh, to uh, re remind you that we distributed now uh, 200, uh, 205,000 cards um, uh, that represents more or less as well one million beneficiaries. So you would imagine that to distribute uh, 200,000 cards in a short time as we did, we had to really join our operation and join our, uh, our systems to be able to make this joint distribution. Uh, the card is distributed to one beneficiary that will benefit from all, this beneficiary will benefit from all these programs so going to collect the card, the beneficiary will be informed in a one communication stream of all the programs that are provided by UNICEF, UNHCR, and WFP. Um, that's why we believe that this joint system is really beneficiary-centered. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so as, as you can see here, uh, the very core of uh, the, the building of that, uh, of that system was UNICEF, UNHCR, and WFP with uh, this uh, consortium of uh, NGOs that disappeared, unfortunately. But now we are joined by other uh, NGOs that want to benefit from the platform that we uh, built uh, with the, 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 the scale that, that we have and that could benefit from our, uh, from our structure. Um, again, it's a single platform. There is many, par many, many partners, one card, but many wallets, many programs, and, uh, and, uh, and many mandates behind it. Thank you. Next slide, please. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, we also have some lessons learned. So having gone through this process over the last three years, uh, if we could go backwards on the presentation, please. Back, one more step. Yeah, here. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, on the leadership and governance. So. In, 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 in simple words, the, um, there was a strong, strong understanding of the concept that this platform will simplify access to cash benefits to refugees and, and our programs. So, and uh, that commitment transpired from uh, our senior leadership towards the operational and technical scheme. We had our reps and country directors involved and available when we had to move very quickly and we will start on certain uh, decision-making process. And, uh, and that's how the governance structure came into light, through the, actually through the development of the key business uh, concept. So Louise, as such, or this platform, this approach, it provides a good balance for the opportunities for collaborations, for collaboration among the agencies, yet still each agency has the ability to uh, manage its programs, for starting from the you know, identification, monitoring, management of this risk, and also uh, have this, this space for uh, programmatic decision making. So in other words, the platform is a collaborative cash system. It's a not one program, doesn't push everybody to adopt just one uh, program. Through the process of the, uh, of, of, of the LOIS and building of the platform, we uh, were able to, to come up with a harmonized business model around the, the common processes, especially when it comes to the card management, payment management, information management to beneficiaries. And that also pushed our teams to come up with very innovative solutions 
by using different, again, different communication channels, by using the, you know, all the high tech in terms uh, to make sure that all the financial and transactional data, uh, beneficiaries data is managed to a very secure, um, you know, channels of settings. The, uh, we further, there, there are also cost benefits. We simply have right now opportunity to, um, to have the efficiency of scale by joining all our programs together. And we also were able to cut on costs. Simply, instead of managing multiple cards, we have one card. Instead of uh, having several or multiple uh, points of distribution for the cards as well as for the teams, we have one process there. We have, again, one communication and one channel uh, to receive also the feedback uh, from uh, refugees. Next slide, please. Uh, from going through the, again, through this platform, um, we also have secondary or cascade effects on uh, the of GWC basically built on the aspects of collaboration, where we see that either from each program, a program would have an opportunity to widen the outreach. In addition, we, we can see that we have actually wider outreach when it comes to the program designs. So each program can then benefit from the program design point of view, and uh, in parallel, each program can, will benefit from the wider outreach. One of the very uh, straightforward examples here would be uh, introduction of the info desk or protection desk during the uh, validation or distribution exercise where we have uh, direct contacts with quite high number of refugees would have various number of questions they have to ask. Then moving to the next point, or another, uh, I would say that uh, very good lessons or uh, the, the, the good practice which we observed is that each agency would have different capacity, different strengths and weaknesses. By bringing our technical teams together, operational teams together, we were able to benefit from each other and then were able to move further, or rather to push the standards for our whole system and this could push the standards up for the common processes. And as a result, we also have, this is a, provides an opportunity for the small scale actors to access the delivery mechanism with the very minimum startup costs. Thank you. We can move to the next slide. Yes, uh, for implementing uh, <coughs> the WIS, uh, it required a lot of uh, work from uh, the different agencies. Uh, we had a very tight timelines to implement it. So one, one of the things like uh, we have learned whenever we are going to uh, implement uh, another uh, collaborative uh, system elsewhere, we need to take into consideration the timeline uh, needed and the workload that we needed uh, to be performed by different stakeholders in order to achieve uh, the goal. Uh, also, we have uh, underestimated uh, the staff effort in terms of coordination and uh, documenting uh, the processes. And uh, we, uh, we need to, to take this uh, very seriously because uh, the history of, uh, of, the per of the platform needs to be documented in a way that others can benefit from it. Like, it's not depending on history of uh, people, just uh, to depend on documents in place so it can be easily transferred to elsewhere. Uh, for replication. Uh, in terms of uh, communication uh, with non-UN actors, uh, while, while trying uh, to make it work, we did not give enough uh, attention to what to communicate uh, and to whom. Like, we did not give uh, the, how big it is what we are achieving. As my colleagues were uh, reflecting, per year we are transferring over $400 million. We have more than 200,000 uh, families receiving cards. Uh, close to 1 million uh, beneficiaries uh, benefiting from this assistance, multiple programs, multiple wallets. So uh, this type of communication to non-UN stakeholders needs to be uh, well emphasized in a way people understand the volume of the operation that's being conducted between uh, mm -hmm. the agencies that they are coordinating to deliver services to the beneficiaries. Next, please. Uh, the beauty of Louise is the replicability. Like we can just take the concept of Louise and uh, replicate it elsewhere. It could be named differently than Louise. Uh, like the structure, how it is structured, 
we have, as the, as the, the colleagues at the beginning of the presentation was mentioning, we have the governing body for, uh, for the, the big decisions that organizations need to take. Uh, we have the steering committee that follows up on the technical uh, decisions that we have on the ground, which are meeting on a mo monthly basis, and they can meet whenever it's needed. Uh, as on operational scheme, uh, the agencies uh, they have dedicated focal points, uh, experts from each agency to work together in terms of achieving the goal of uh, ensuring a smooth operation and a smooth implementation of the project of, uh, and the introduction of new uh, programs and also to allow others to join uh, the LUIS uh, platform at any given time. Uh, behind all this, we had uh, we went through a competitive procurement process and a tendering process where we have jointly defined the technical requirements of this tendering document. We have captured all the technical requirements to cover restricted and unrestricted cash on the card, to cover the multiple wallets, and to ensure the secure transfer of information between the agencies and from the agencies to the financial service provider, ending up by the distribution uh, to the beneficiaries in a very secure way. Also, uh, after the tendering document, we went to a joint legal process where we have uh, uh, built a chapeau, uh, an umbrella that can cover, uh, cover our relationship with the financial service provider, which makes it easy for any new actor to join uh, the platform. So there is no need for others to go into negotiation or tendering process with the same financial service provider. All they need to do is just uh, to accede to the platform by signing a participation agreement where, where we have already negotiated uh, all technical requirements and prices. Uh, one of the important things uh, that we have also can, could be replicated is the, the system uh, interoperability that we have uh, established here like uh, how systems between the different agencies are talking to each other through uh, secure channels, using APIs, using uh, virtual uh, private network and uh, secure file transfer protocols, or different types of securities uh, that we have applied to ensure the data protection and the privacy of our beneficiaries by respecting our corporate uh, data protection uh, policies. Plus, uh, we have uh, uh, also established uh, different tools such as uh, I am Luis, uh, which is a portal, gives you a lot of information about the various Luis activities uh, at any given uh, cycle. And in addition to this, we have uh, established under the umbrella of the Luis system, we have established uh, the joint distribution system, which consists of uh, uh, checking the biometrics of the people receiving the card and plus validating the people at, after a certain time if they are still in the country and still have uh, still in possession of the card by validating their iris and the facial recognition. Thank you. Thank you guys. Super interesting and great to see the collaboration happening at uh, various levels in various departments. Um, now we've got the, the most interesting part arguably of this webinar, which is the Q&A. Um, so I think the first set of questions will direct at Max um, in relation to the, the mobile payments and the user-centered design. And I guess the most salient one relates to the fact that today's International Migrants Day, and one of our audience asked the question, how was the identity of the cash transfer recipient established? Do you have problems when refugees had no travel documents or forms of identification? And how did you resolve these issues? So, Max, do you have any initial reactions to that? Absolutely. Um, so, the mobile wallet system is uh, based entirely upon phone numbers. So, the way that that, beneficia that uh, beneficiaries or recipients, so whether or not it's a it's a, um, a recipient that's that's part of a, a a cash transfer program or just receiving cash from relatives or whatever. Mobile wallets are all based on phone numbers, so that's how that, they're identified. Um, with in Jordan, um, in order to sign up for a mobile wallet, there is a know your customer process that does require documentation. It's much less documentation than um, a bank account, for example, but there is something that's called a, 
a Ministry of Interior card uh, that is available to all Syrian refugees um, that they were able to sign up for. And there was a recent amnesty that's um, still going on. So if people didn't have civil documents or were off camp that weren't supposed to be out of, outside of camps, um, there was an amnesty in which they could normalize their status. Um, so we tried to take advantage of that, and the entire humanitarian sector tried to take advantage of that, um, partly for the reason that with that document, um, Syrian refugees anyway could sign up for a mobile wallet to receive these payments. Um, a non-Syrian refugees, as we have a significant population of, um, of uh, Yemeni refugees and then also Somali uh, and Iraqi refugees, um, they would need to use, since they weren't able to have access to the Ministry of Interior card program, they would have to have a valid passport um, that either they would have to have or they would have to go and, and get it from, um, from the, the, one of their embassy here in, in Jordan. Um, so that's the, that was the process. And, and so there's a very small percentage of people that don't have access to any of those documents. Um, but without access to those documents, it does make it very difficult. Uh, but by and large, the vast majority did have access to the documents that were able to to allow them to open a wallet and receive it. Very interesting. I think the whole KYC issue is a recurring, a recurring problem in most of the locations we're working in. Um, finally, uh, a couple of quick questions. Um, so it sounds like the pilots you're describing are mainly driven by humanitarian need or organizations. Mm -hmm. You describe the role of the mobile network operators and their desire for adoption. And then within that, um, uh, can the mobile wallets be used across a wider acceptance network in stores, shops, kiosks? Um, and how does that interact with the mobile network operators? Sure. And something I saw there was a question in the sidebar that is worth answering. Um, the in Jordan there are both mobile network operator and mobile wallet providers. So Zane uh, has a solution called Zane Cash. Umnia has a solution. Uh, a lot of the major providers have a, a a mobile wallet solution. There are also standalone providers that are not um, MNO operators that are not mobile network operators that just offer a a a mobile based uh, mobile wallet solution. Um, could you ask the second part of that question? Was it about interoperability? Sorry, I was focused on the first part. Yes, it was basically, um, you know, how is how is interoperability being driven by the mobile network operators, and you know, to what extent are these wallets going to be used outside the kind of humanitarian purview, i.e., for kind of business as usual by the individual? Yeah. So the CBJ, Central Bank of Jordan, has mandated interoperability. Um, but implementing that, it's still unclear exactly what they mean because interoperability could mean sending and receiving payments across providers, um, or it could mean reloading and cashing out of wallets at any one of the net, uh, one of the agents uh, of any of the of the providers. So there's a a lot of different definitions of what interoperability means, and that hasn't been necessarily clarified um, by any of the kind of governing bodies of. Uh, the mobile wallet infrastructure here in Jordan. Um, so that's still a big question, and that leads to a lot of consumer confusion. Um, in terms of outside of humanitarian usage, there's a lot of exciting potential opportunities to use mobile wallets. Uh, some of the ones I mentioned were uh, like revolving loan cooperatives. So those are very popular among both Jordanians and, um, and, and refugees. Um, and they're a great way to, to kind of smooth consumption and, and, and establish resiliency and such. Um, and mobile wallets are a potentially great way to kind of expand the scale and the accountability and transparency of those kind of already existing financial behaviors. Uh, yeah. Another one would be facilitating trade around Jordan kind of domestic remittances and payments and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. A lot of options. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm just aware of time. We've got uh, roughly 10 minutes left, so I'm going to pass the baton over to William. Um, so one of the first questions we had was around, do you follow the same KYC standards as mobile network operators and banks for customer enrollment? Um, and did you look into identity standards for transferring identities between aid agencies or service providers? Thank you, Ash. Um, yeah, so Regarding the, the KYC, um, the, so the KYC, the way it works is it's based, it's defined by risk-based assessment um, that are carried out by uh, central banks, for example. And also, um, it follows what we call the Financial Action Task Force 40 recommendation, F, uh, FATF uh, 40. 
Um, and then, uh, so what does that mean? That means um, there are different type of KYC and the KYC is not necessarily triggered under a certain threshold amount. Uh, so let's say, you know, if uh, you need, if there are some KYC requirement uh, like above uh, $50, uh, if you distribute less than $50, you don't necessarily trigger um, the KYC process. Um, so yes, uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, and sometimes it's a negotiation also happening uh, because the beneficiaries cannot necessarily provide the necessary, the necessary documentation. Um, however, it's probably a good idea, even if we don't, uh, to align our humanitarian assistance cards uh, with uh, official documentation requirement uh, that would require some level of KYC because it helps building digital identification. And if you do have an ID, uh, that means you know you can have an history of financial transaction, you can have access to essential services, um, and uh, it protects yourself. Um, uh, it protects ourselves as well, you know, like in terms of accountability, uh, and also the beneficiary, the people affected. So um, yeah. That's uh, that's answering the question. And if you want more information on, on data protection uh, regarding cash, there is an excellent toolkit from Elan and Mercy Corps called the Data Protection Toolkit uh, that I recommend to everyone. And also, sorry, just to answer, I saw another question regarding the limiting factor. Uh, someone asking, you know, if that means there is no barrier. Yes, uh, there are barriers. It's just the technology, the potential of the technology now uh, make it like virtually there is no barrier. We can have Wi-Fi everywhere and phone network everywhere, but the barriers, uh, they are huge. Uh, they are, we don't have user center product now, not enough. Uh, it's very designed for us and not enough for the user. Uh, also, the use of technology, you know, we need to clean more data and standardize more for more interoperability. And finally, there is huge issues regarding uh, data protection that we need to address uh, and data sharing. I very much agree. I think uh, the underlying issue affecting all of the, the kind of data is the data standards, both from a protection and a sharing viewpoint. Um, and I think that segues quite nicely into the, the third presentation. So I was just wondering um, to the UN folks, is Louise a model that can be expected for the future UN common cash system? Is this the kind of model and blueprint you guys think that will be scaled? Oh, and yes and no. So basically, Louise was already looking to that as one of the potential models, uh, which again, where the heart of it is the beneficiary or centric approach and provide the space for collaboration. It's a collaborative system. So certain elements of it, yes, for sure. Will it be like copy-paste? No, because it, each, each country, each uh, context will have, will have its specificity. So I think that through Louise, we actually learned that we need to have that flexibility to be, uh, to, to be, to be able to adapt to the context. So certain the principles, the approach, yes. And the underlying there is the uh, looking towards the collaborative cash systems. Okay, very interesting. Um, and I saw one of the posts from uh, the group was, do you have any thoughts on why some of the aid agencies might have pulled out of this system? Um, I don't mean to be kind of um, too yeah, political. I mean, we talk, I mean, I think the question was about the, 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 the consortium. So basically it was really a funding issue, right? So um, the, the NGOs that were in that consortium had like a funding shortage and they decided to, uh, you know, they had many other activities apart from the cash. So they uh, decided to um, let's uh, to concentrate on the other activities that they had. However, we still have uh, Save the Children that is like uh, represents, uh, you know, this uh, this consortium and still part uh, on the of the board of uh, of Louise and uh, all these organizations that were present before can re-enter. Uh, with no, uh, I mean, with uh, no specific process uh, into the into the wings, right? So, so they 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 stopped because basically they had funding, uh, let's say, uh, challenges. Okay, very interesting. 
Um, so I'm just aware of time, um, so I guess I should do a quick wrap up and then pass the baton over to Sonia to give some final um, next steps and housekeeping. Um, I think first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our presenters and everybody who's had the time to come and listen to this very interesting and topical presentation, looking at digital tools for humanitarian response or digital financial tools for humanitarian response. I think what's very clear is that the value chain for humanitarian aid, as well as the kind of wider service sector is changing very quickly for the demographic and beneficiaries we're looking to target. And with that, there's going to be a lot of change. Um, and I think exciting change. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass my baton over to Sonia and Frederick to wrap up. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alish. Thank you very much for moderating this webinar for us. And um, thank you for all the speakers for your very interesting um, case studies and insights. Um, so, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you on board for this webinar. Um, i just like to um, also say thank you to our attendees for joining us again. That was our last ICT4D webinar for the year. We will be back next year. We're currently working on a schedule and also on um, yeah, what, what topics we'd like to address. So if there's any specific topics you'd like to hear in our ICT4D webinar series, um, please send me an email and a suggestion of the topic, or if you also like to uh, join us as a speaker, we're always looking um, for new insights. Um, so we'll be coming back in January and share with you uh, uh, details on the upcoming schedule. I also take, like to take this opportunity to um, share with you uh, some information about the upcoming ICT4D conference that will take place on April the 30th to May the 3rd in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, we will have, we'll expect around 1,000 attendees, um, mostly program managers, ICT4D and data experts uh, from NGOs, private sector, government agencies, donor agencies, academia, so very all actors involved in the ICT4D programming, uh, looking at development and humanitarian response topics. We will have 10 different conference tracks. Uh, some of them are, uh, again, looking at agriculture, health, education, uh, digital diversity and inclusion, and particularly of interest, hopefully, to this group will be a track on uh, humanitarian response, also uh, on digital financial inclusion. And um, we uh, still have one open call for speakers on a track on responsible data and information security. Uh, so if you are interested, um, please uh, go on our website. Um, the link is here. We also share it afterwards. And we still accept speaker applications until January 4th. Um, the main call for speakers is already closed. We received over 750 applications. So thank you to everybody who has showed interest. It's a very interesting uh, um, and very popular uh, topic. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, see you again, either at our next webinar or maybe in Kampala. And uh, thank you also very much to NetHope for facilitating this webinar with us again. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sonia. Um, I uh, want to thank you for producing the series of webinars. It's very interesting, and it's great to keep the momentum going between the ict for d uh, uh, conferences um, uh, every year. Uh, thank you, Alesh, for um, monitoring this today, and uh, thanks to, again to the speakers. Uh, we will be sending out a follow-up email um, uh, shortly, and you'll see all the speakers' email addresses, and you'll be able to reach out to them uh, with, if you have uh, additional questions. And last but not all, uh, at least, uh, please uh, have a look at the webinar satisfaction poll that will show up in your browser as we close out the webinar today. And keep an eye on upcoming webinars in the link that I just posted to the NetUp Solutions Center. With that, I wish everybody a great rest of your day. We'll be back in touch soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.